Fish Schwartz with my co-host Nancy Wilk for another edition of Homeschooling Help. And today we're going to explore how to make your homeschool more successful by including extended family. So Nancy, why don't you sort of introduce why we're interested in talking about this? Sure. Well, um, hello. Thank you again. It's always a pleasure being with you, Andre. But um, one of the things that we do here at Church in Maine is to return to the family the responsibilities that God says is ours. And one of those responsibilities is to train up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And to we think that the way to do that is through educating them and preparing them for their for God's call on their life that has to do with their, with their vocation and their, um, the way God has particularly um, gifted them. And we look at, to those things and anticipate that's, that's how um, he will be using them in, in the future. So um, that's just one of the things that, that we look at. Another thing that um, we think is really important is that um, in returning to the family, the responsibilities is ours is, is that we see that as the primary building block in the first place where the children learn self-government and it's their first school, their first church, their first um, everything. We learn everything that we're supposed to learn is in that seedbed of the home. So it's really, really an, an important place. So today we want to talk about um, the importance of the family and how really making that strong is a, is really an asset to your children's education. Not and not just a little extra benefit, but but really how that becomes the war and weave of our lives in our community. And it's important to expand what we mean by family. Too often we think of the family as mom and dad and the kids. And if you limit it to that, there are a couple of things that are negative that will happen, especially in a homeschool setting. Mom will burn out because everything then places on mom. Dad's supporting the family. He's making sure that they can continue to survive in terms of having a roof over their head, food on their plates, clothes to wear. And if mom is doing it all by herself, then she can burn out and she can get overwhelmed. And sometimes she's not really as good at all the things she wants her children to learn. And when I was homeschooling my children, I decided to incorporate extended family. Now, I'm in California and my dad, who has since passed away, um, was in New York. And neither one of us did a whole lot of traveling across the country, except on rare occasions. This, keep in mind, this was before the Internet. This was before FaceTime and Face chatting and things like that. But I wanted him to be happy and content with my decision. At first, he was like, oh, no, you're not going to homeschool. I'll pay for private school because I had been privately educated when I was growing up. I'll pay for it. And it's like, no, Dad, what we're going to do is homeschool. Well, in order not to have him think that his grandchildren were being undereducated or poorly educated, writing assignments, artwork, I made sure that went in the mail and Grandpa got it so he could put it on his refrigerator. And because my dad, who's um, was an MD by profession and was very big on reading in the dictionary. He used to assign vocabulary words that my children would have to look up. And it was very simple. They had to look up the word. They had to write out the definition and they had to mail him back when they had five and he would pay them. Well, my <laughs> son who loved money was like, I think I need some money. I want to buy this. I want to buy that. Could you call up grandpa and ask him to send some more vocabulary words? And so, of course, this is my grandfather, my grandfather, my father was thrilled. He wanted, you know, my kids to learn how to use a dictionary so he they would be good and better at communicating and things like that. And he got involved. And then there were times when book reports were sent and things that they had read. And then when they got older, discussions where they could argue on the phone about different points of view and whatever. 
But my father, who originally started off being somewhat iffy about this idea, then started praising homeschool, telling all his relatives and friends about what a great job Andrew was doing. And those children are so smart. And, and I would have cousins going, yeah, your father's always talking about, you know, your homeschool and things like that. So by including him, I was able to handle the negative idea he had, because at the time we're talking, you know, early mid eighties, this wasn't something that everybody did. Right. Now were my dad alive and my kids were of, you know, school age, I could plug them right in front of a computer, make sure he had one. And as a doctor, he could teach them a lot of things. So including the expertise of extended family is huge and it can provide some relief in terms of if science isn't your forte or history isn't as, as um, something that you're as versed in as you'd like to be. If you've got relatives who, number one, potentially are retired, give them something purposeful to do. And they have stories, even if they're just family stories. They're in a position to truly educate your children about their family. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. I do have a, um, all of my grandchildren are being homeschooled. And one of them particularly has taken up being my pen pal. And she always signs her little letters to me, your magnificent granddaughter. <laughs> and um, so um, we love doing that. But, but when you are able to connect the interest and skills of other family members, um, it, it is a great way to build those bonds. So, so much of the things that we do now, even going to church, separates families. And this is a very purposeful way of bringing them back together so we don't miss those stories. And we, we um, can, with, with um, purpose and have opportunity to reinforce those relationships and to share with our children and grandchildren the wisdom of our own experience and maturity in the Lord. And sometimes the best stories are, let me tell you what I did that I wouldn't do again. <clears throat> I have one grandchild who every time we see her, tell me more stories about my dad. Tell me things that my dad did that were wrong growing up. And I would say, no, we don't have to talk about things your dad did wrong, but let's talk about why people do things that are wrong. And then I'll tell stories about myself. In fact, uh, two of the books that I've written are children's books, read aloud story books. One is called Teach Me While My Heart is Tender, and the other one is called Family Matters. And those are stories about real things that happened in our family. And a lot of times, <clears throat> I don't look so good in those stories because I made some mistakes or I, I used some bad judgment. And some of the stories are about me as a child. And so it's a very important way of connecting, but connecting more than just on a superficial level, as Christian grandparents, being able to incorporate the lessons we learned, relating it back to God's word. Now, the reason this is so important, okay, not that anything I said wasn't important, but why it's so important is our society has lost the idea of the family as a power center. Most people don't think of the family as a power center. They think of it as, you know, the family, where you eat, where you sleep, until you're about 18 years old, you go on vacations together. And boy, oh boy, I can't wait until I don't have to do everything mom and dad wants us to do. Mm -hmm. Well, if we restore the family as a power center, that means the family has to take back things like health, education, and welfare, which are the domain of the family assigned by God. So mm -hmm. God doesn't take it easily, you might say, when one institution, in the case of the state, appropriates things that he wants the family to do. And so we've got to start. Now, some people will say, you don't know my mother and father. I could never include them in my homeschool for my kids. They're not Christian. Well, guess what? So what? Build a bridge, find a way in which they can contribute. And how do you know that your children won't be the means by which they come to faith? You see, we've got to restore the family with all its imperfections, you know, there's this joke, put the fun back in dysfunctional. Who doesn't think they have a dysfunctional family? 
And then you hear somebody else's stories and you say, well, your family doesn't sound so bad. Let me tell you about my family. Well, let's build up the family so that we can appreciate the differences and not make that a hindrance going forward. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I think that um, it's really important for us to return to, to begin to reclaim the responsibilities of the family because we live in a culture where family can be whatever we make it up to be. And God has defined family and um, in all of its dysfunction, like you said, but there's also the sense of family being just the people that you take pictures with on holidays. So we, we really need to look at God's definition of family, the family that we've got, and to begin to be fun, learn how to function the way that we're supposed to and not be trying to escape the family or find another one or get one that we like better, but to deal with the people that God has given us to deal with properly. Even in the, it's so easy when your children are young to talk about all the deficits in your parents or your siblings, but guess what? Your children are going to get older and have they seen an attitude where you've, you know, dis, um, discounted your extended family? Will they do the same thing? And so if you want a future with your grandchildren, if you want a future where you can be an asset and they can be an asset to you, then they got to know each other and they have to know each other, you know, with warts and all. When you spend time with somebody, you find out their strengths and you find out their weaknesses. And, you know, when we say the Lord's Prayer to forgive trespasses, that's where you learn to forgive trespasses in the family. Because guess what? A day won't go by when you're not trespassed in some way and you don't do the trespassing yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but what about that case when there are family members? that are not just a little bit dysfunctional, but like really obviously living a lifestyle that is contrary to the Lord. What do you do with those family members? Well, first of all, let's make sure that they really are living contrary to the Lord as opposed to contrary to your particular theological bent. Because how many of us have had disagreements with fellow believers only to be told, well, you're not really a believer. You're not really a believer. But think mm -hmm. of all the people we deal with on a regular basis. When you go to the Department of Motor Vehicles, when you go to the grocery store, guess what? You're dealing with imperfect people, some of which don't agree with you ideolo ideologically. So mm -hmm. aside from someone who is actively in a reprobate situation and would be a danger to you and your children, you need to explain to your children, uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so, they don't live according to the scripture and we should pray for them. So the children should already know that they're praying for family members, right? Mm -hmm. And that perfection isn't what we're striving for in terms of what our relationships will be. We should strive to be perfect in terms of mature in our faith, in terms of not knowingly do things that God says not to do. But if we're to go disciple the nations, why doesn't it count to do your extended family, grandparents, aunts and uncles or cousins? See, in an age of Facebook, it's so easy to be anonymous. Oh, I can yell at people I'll never meet. And I can pretend that we're friends and show each other our pancakes or whatever we made, but do we know how to relate to people? And I think by in encouraging that, by having hospitality and whatever, but not losing sight of who you are and who your family is. If we're a family right. under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then that should be obvious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Uncle so-and-so might be, doing things that we would not want to model, but he could still be a great mechanic. Right. right. So we can learn the part that we can learn. Right. And you would have to make the decision that your kids don't stay over at uncle's house, but you can have some interaction. And um, instead of making it in isolation, because guess what? By the time your children get older, they're going to have to learn how to deal with lots of different people. 
Um, some of the best stories I have that I get to share with my kids when they were growing up are some of the family dinners with all the extended family. Um, they say, oh, tell that story again. We like that story because basically you had to learn to live with people and not everybody looked at things the same way. And uh, yeah. so I think when we're talking about the success of the homeschool, I'm going well beyond academics. This isn't just about have a successful academic life, although the academics can be included, but you brought up vocational skills. So if uncle so-and-so is a mechanic, he can teach your son or daughter how to change a tire, how to change the oil, right? Mm -hmm. And in the process, they know that they have a responsibility to share Christ. Now, again, you don't decide that, you know, your six-year-old is going to go convert your 40-year-old brother, right? right? But you do have opportunity where they interact. And nine times out of 10, people will say, your kids are so well-behaved. Homeschooling is great. So you're at very least, you're putting a great plug in for homeschooling. Right, right. One of the things that in our uh, family, it, it happens regularly, Nana has different rules at her house than the kids might have at their house. And um, so one of the things that Nana gets to explain is why we have the rules that we have. And so um, if we're thinking um, to put God's order back, back into our lives and our family, then and we can give an account for what we believe instead of Nana's house having arbitrary rules and Nana being, you know, a mini tyrant. Nana can say, God, we do it this way because God's word tells us that that we need to steward the resources that he's entrusted to our care, for example. So, um. Um, I was reading a book here um, recently and the author, I think it was Rush Dooney, um, was talking about um, not falling short of um, returning to, to the biblical order. We just want to deal with the condition of people instead of looking at God's purposeful order. So that's something that, um, that I think that we can often just sort of say, well, you know, uncle so-and-so is a little, he's a little rough. So we're going to stay away from him instead of really giving the children real tools and real um, biblical direction about how and why um, things are the way that they are. Right. You agree and with that? The example of that you gave that the rules are different at your house than at, let's say, your son or daughter's house. It isn't that you have to put down your son and daughter's rules. They have a different set of circumstances. And so it's a great opportunity to talk about Christian liberty within the context of not doing something that's wrong. So chances are your son or daughters don't allow your grandkids to slash furniture and walk all the, over the table and, you know, destroy things. But because of the setup of the house and day in and day out and what your functions that you use your your house when your grandkids aren't there, there are certain things that you want to be observed. And so it doesn't have to be a conflict of interest. And I guess that's the biggest message here. Yes, we can always focus on what's wrong with our families, but mm -hmm. we can look at ways in which we can build a bridge and have a harmony of interest. Most grandparents want their grandchildren to thrive. Not all, but most. And so making sure if you're a homeschooling family and your you know, in-laws or your parents aren't quite sure what you're doing, make sure you show them the successes and they don't see Facebook posts that say, I'm ready to pull my hair out. When will I ever have time for myself? I mean, that's certainly not the way to promote that homeschooling is something beneficial. So be honest, you know, some days you're tired. Hey, mom, dad, sister, brother, do you mind? You know, you really love to garden. Could you teach my kids how to garden? Or you're such a great seamstress. How about my kids learn to, to, to sew or crochet or whatever it is, or cook or what, whatever it's going to be and get people involved. My experience is when people are involved, the bonds get closer. 
And mm -hmm. I think that's something we can strive for and see how not only does it serve the homeschool purpose, but it also serves God's purpose for returning to the family the power and authority God wants it to have and has ordained it to have. Right. So that we're looking at a uh, common interest and uh, rather than a con conflicting interest and, um, and representing him well in, in every area of life. I think of another thing, like um, maybe there's people in your family in some families who maybe are, um, have a particular uh, denominational preference. Others have, a different denominational preference, but they can still get together and and celebrate uh, Christ. We are Christians first, and need to re need to recognize that. Right. And let me say this: there are plenty of women that I mentor, and usually there are people not exclusively, but there are people in my local area. Some that I do online, and. In a way, I'm like a spiritual mother to them, but I always make sure that they don't discount their mother because of the relationship we have, that they should still honor their mother and their father and use our relationship as a way to bridge the gaps. And so a lot of times there are things I'll say that guess what? Their parents have said before. And I'll say, be sure to tell your parents that um, the woman you go to for mentoring said the same thing they did. She thinks you were actually right in that situation. And being able to thank people for the way in which they raised you. See, here's the deal. We don't choose our own families. God does. And so if we're going to discount them, then maybe we're saying God made a bad decision. And we never want to go to God made a bad decision because he's incapable of making bad decisions. Right. Even in the worst families, we should at least be able to say to to thank God for the family that we have, because if nothing else, it required that we recognize our need for him. Exactly. Yeah. And remember that honor your father and your mother is the first commandment with the promise. And you could say it's the first commandment that says, if you want success, do this. And so the homeschool, if nothing else, should honor the father and the mother, not the personality so much as the position, because mm -hmm. our calling in life starts off being a son or a daughter. So just those designations put us in a family. And so honoring our mother and honoring our father is all about honoring the authority structure that God put in place. And if we're honestly going to look at the dominion mandate, the mandate that says, you know, Go disciple the nations, be fruitful and multiply. That command is given to families, not to the church, not to the state. The church and state have their function, but mostly it's to help the family in terms of its dominion calling. And so we don't want to succumb to the societal forces that want to destroy the family. And mm -hmm. our current state situation has so many ways that it's doing that that we've got to combat it by saying, no, that's not how we're going to play this game. We're going to do it God's way. Right. right. And God's, God's way is that we disciple, that we become self-governing, self-disciplined, discipling our own children first before we go and try and disciple the children in faraway continents, you know, and uh, so we so we really have to start where we live, being the people that God has called us to be in the context of the people that he's given us to live life with. Exactly. Exactly. Marriage is one of those things you never take a rest from. You don't take a rest from family either. You still are a mom. You're still a dad. You're still a son or a daughter. And so it's important that we value where God has placed us and realize and I get the fruit of this now, that sometimes those same children that you raised, sometimes they're your go-to person saying, I need some advice here. Because you know where they're coming from and you know the foundations on which they were taught. So it ends up being a win to raise your children to honor their family and their extended family because someday you're going to be part of that extended family. That's right. In a different role. Right. 
Right. Well, I'm at a loss. You, you just do such a, such a great explanation of these things. So um, I do have one other solution for people whose parents aren't close by. One of the things okay. I did for my youngest is when she was growing up and she was learning objects and she was, you know, like this is a square, this is a circle. I created a scrapbook that had pictures of all the people in our family. So she would see a picture and say grandpa, even though she never saw grandpa as often as she could have. Now today, like I said, we've got Facebook and if Facebook is good at anything, it's putting up pictures of family and whatnot. And we've got the opportunity to do it, but make use of the recognition that this is your father, this is your mother, this is his father and his mother. And I think it would be a really interesting thing for more families to work on their genealogies so that they would know what's the name of their great grandparents? Where are they from? What did they do for a living? Do you have pictures of them? Do they look like you? And seeing all the various things you have in common as a way in which to establish once again, that the family is God's primary and central institution. And we got to believe it. And we've got to act like it's that way because God says it's that way. Yeah, so when we read in the scripture about Jesus' genealogy and all these people's genealogy, we just have a tendency to just sort of skip over that and think it's it's irrelevant, just a list of names. And, it, and it's really not. It teaches us that these, these connections are God-ordered and, and valuable in ways that in our American culture, we're so, we're so individualized and um, independent and selfish that we don't recognize the, the value of those things. And when we do, rec if we do start putting those back together, sometimes it's just, like I said, for pictures or for sentimental purposes and not really um, building the strength in our, um, in our relationships and our cultures and in our lives. It, with the purpose that God has for them. Right. And just, you brought up genealogies. It's not just the good guys who have genealogies recounted. We get the genealogy of Esau, for example. Obviously that matters. I mean, we, we wouldn't call him a stellar person in terms of everybody trying to act like Esau, but God still recognizes families. And what we don't realize often is that Marxists and communists and statists want to destroy the family. So if you get people thinking as individuals, as opposed to members of families, you're going to have a much greater opportunity to dominate their lives because all you're doing is becoming the parent you have separated them from. Families mm -hmm. are inescapable. Power and authority are inescapable things. The question is, is it God's authority or is it that of fallen man? And we want to be on the right side of that question. Right, right, right. Well, Andrea, you brought up some really important things I think that a lot of our listeners maybe have not considered before. Um, one of the things that we really want to do on this homeschool help and with our Epimetix area family educators is to recognize that we're not just talking about academics for children, but for the whole family to um, learn to build and function from a biblical worldview. I think you do a great job of explaining these things and helping us to, to rethink some of these things and putting it back into the God um, assigned place and biblical context so that the Bible in our relationship with the Lord is not just something that we sprinkle, you know, over the top or weave through our curriculum, but it is the very foundation and entire context, comprehensive context of our lives that we so, so often overlook in, um, in what is very often church today. Right. So we appreciate it. Well, good. Let me make a recommendation for those who are interested in getting a more biblical look at how God intends for the family to operate. There is a lecture series that's available at calcedon.edu called The Doctrine of the Family. And it's okay. six lectures, but very potent. 
And what's particularly interesting is that they were recorded decades ago, still very timely, but it gives this orientation, especially in terms of um, what has been lost and where we need to go and how and what we need to regain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we can get those links up for the yeah. For I'll the, put them um, up after when we're done and such. But anyway, thanks for a good conversation, and uh, we'll see you next week. Have a good one. Next week. Thank you, ma'am.